Welcome to We Do the Heavy Lifting. I'm your host, Dr. Jenny Yentis, and today we do para-athletes or para-athletics. So a lot of us don't quite know what that is. We may have heard of the Paralympics. We may have some idea of what this means, but really we're going to dig into that today and learn quite a bit more about this area of competition. So to do that, we have our expert, Dr. Lisa Colvin. She is an associate pro professor at uh, Texas A&M University in the Department of Kinesiology and sp Sports Management. Sport Management. Um, your research interests are really focused in para-athletics training and performance optimization. All of those good pieces. I love that. So most people, like I said, are not familiar with para-athletics. Can you describe who are these athletes that are participating in these sports? If you think about like the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. this is where most people have been exposed to para-athletes. So really, para-Olympics means parallel games. Okay. So it's parallel with the Olympic Games, and that's um, what the International Paralympic Committee wanted it to be. So elite-level athletes at the same level as your traditional Olympic Games – will be on the para-athletic side. They are just classified different. Uh, say, for example, the 100-meter dash in track and field. You would have the same type of event in the Paralympics, but these individuals would be classified based on their impairment. Okay. And what sort of impairment uh, impairments do we see that individuals um, possess in the para-athletics? Um, because I think, at least when I was uninformed and ignorant about the situation, I didn't quite know the difference from Special Olympics. Right. And so what are, what are the impairments that... That's, that's a great the, question. The, the International Paralympic Committee does recognize both the Paralympics and Special Olympics, but they have two completely different foci, okay. and their, um, their missions are different. So the Paralympics are more focused on competition. Okay. Whereas Special Olympics is more focused on participation, uh, participation mm -hmm. and doesn't exclude any athlete okay. based on their disability. Okay. So the classification for para-athletes uh, is it creates a level playing field. Okay. So that's what a classification do. So you could be a classifier. I could be a classifier. We go through a course, and you have an athlete come in, and we classify them in one of ten areas. Okay. So the ten areas include impaired muscle power. So that's like spinal cord injuries, um, muscular dystrophy, post-polio syndrome, um, impaired passive range of motion. So that would be chronic uh, joint immobility, um, limb deficiencies. So uh, that could be from a traumatic amputation. Uh, limb deficiencies, so uh, length difference. Oh, okay. Short stature yeah. is another area. Uh, hypertonia, which is uh, basically increased muscle tone. Okay. So those would be, again, cerebral palsy, traumatic brain disorders, and stroke, um, visual impairment. So okay. blindness. And there is uh, an intellectual impairment level. Um, you have to be classified before you are th at the age of 18. Okay. So that's a difference. So Special Olympics, it's inclusive of all um, disabilities and impairments in the intellectual spectrum, whereas um, Paralympics, the intellectual impairment is the impairment present before the age of 18. Okay. So I'm glad that you brought those notes there because that's, there's a lot of classification. That's a lot of information to remember there. There are, and the classifications also are a little bit different from sport to sport to sport. Okay. So in the Paris Olympics, it's coming up in 24, um, the summer games are going to include, and I'll just read them off. It's, it's amazing. Archery, athletics. So athletics in the United States is called track and field. Okay. But out, throughout the world, it's athletics. Badminton. Blind volleyball, bocce is, um, and goalball, those are, they do not have 
the traditional Olympic counterparts, but all these other okay. ones do. Canoeing, cycling, equestrian, judo, powerlifting, rowing, shooting, volleyball, swimming, table tennis, taekwondo, triathlon, uh, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair fencing, wheelchair rugby, and wheelchair tennis. All of those are Olympic sports. And on the winter side, we have alpine skiing, biathlon, cross-country skiing, para, ice hockey, snowboarding, and curling. That's pretty incredible. I don't think that most of our listeners are even aware of that, bre- the cl- one, the classifications, but the breadth of sports that are available for competition in these areas. So let's take uh, cycling, for instance. Yeah. Um, what are the accommodations that are made for these? How, how does cycling look different in the Paralympics than it does in the Olympics? So in the, on the uh, traditional Olympic side, typically the bicycles are what we normally have as two wheels, mm-hmm. right? So the traditional bicycle. We have road racing, which is on the road, and they ride in a pack s- similar to, say, the Tour de France. Okay. So, but it's all just a one-day race, a, a one-time race. Then they have individual time trial, where it's a race against the clock on the road. The second type of cycling is in a velodrome. So it's an indoor track that you either race against the clock, against opponents, or you do a race that's a pursuit. So one team starts or individual starts on one side of the track, one starts on the other, and you go for uh, amount of distance, and whoever gets to the finish line first wins. Is there a disadvantage there because somebody, they started in different places? Yeah, they, they start, um, so just like a regular track, they start on equal sides, mm-hmm. on both sides, and they start at the same exact time. Okay. Yep. So they okay. start at the same time, and whoever crosses the finish line first wins. So if it's over, say, uh, five kilometers, they just, they ride for five kilometers, and who finishes that five kilometers first? I see. That will be your winner. Okay. On the para side, um, on the road, we have the two-wheel bike, just like on the traditional side. Mm-hmm. But we also have um, hand cycling. So hand cycling is a recumbent bicycle. Right. So they, they um, mm-hmm. cycle with two, so they're synchronous. So this is they pedal with their arms. I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They can also kneel and pedal with their arms. They can ride uh, a tandem bicycle. So you have a person riding in the front, person riding in the back. Usually it's visually impaired. So you have the driver in the front, what I call the stoker, or the visually impaired athlete is in the back. And that's on the road also. They also have a tricycle, so three wheels. So this is for individuals with um, balance impairments, uh, or they're classified that they can ride that type of equipment and race that type of equipment. So that's really the big difference. Um, On the track, the only addition is um, the tandem bicycle. So when we're um, we're talking about these individuals and we talk about cycling and we have different cycles, there's trikes, there's tandem, there's two wheel. Right. How do you, how do you create a level competition as you said? So the classifiers will um, have appointments for athletes to come in to actually be put into an area, a classification area. Okay. So take, for example, and I'll refer back to my notes, we have the physical impairments. So you have a medical doctor, physical therapist, uh, biomechanist, um, motor sp- um, exercise physiologist, uh, individuals in your area, Mm -hmm. uh, neuromotor sports, and you all will come together, evaluate that athlete, and decide what classification you're in. So, for example, if you're blind, Mm -hmm. there's different levels of blindness. So they have it classified as level one, Mm -hmm. two, and three. So you could be a low number. So the low number means that you are completely blind. You have no sight at all, whereas a number two is you have some sight, but you still need a guide. A level three is you can compete without a guide, Um, so that creates kind of that level playing field in, say, for example, visual impairment. So although you have a visual impairment classification, 
factors. The lower the classification, yeah, the lower the number, the higher the impairment. I see. So that's how the, they become equivalent. So it's trying to level the playing field, not based on, say, gender, but on um, impairment level mm-hmm. um, and in classification. That's, it's important. It's something that I guess I've never really considered is not only are there the classifications, but you need the levels within the classifications in order to make sure that people, and these are individuals competing at elite levels. Yeah, th- they are at the, the most yeah. elite levels there are. For fact, many of these athletes could compete in the traditional Olympic side. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's take, for example, track and field. Um, there is a para-athlete, his name is Hunter Woodall. He was actually the first uh, Division I track and field athlete to get a scholarship um, at any Division I school. So he was scholarshiped at the University of Arkansas, mm-hmm. and he is a three-time All-American in track and field. So he was given no accommodation, no anything. is a double, um, double amputee, and he runs with his able-bodied partners. So he runs the 400 meters. Uh, he ran the 4 by 400 meters and the distance medley. So he not only competes, you know, at the world-class level on the para side, but he could compete in the traditional side. He did at the NCAA level. Um, another athlete on the track and field side, Lexi uh, Gallette. Lexi Gallette is totally blind. So he's a visually impaired one. So, okay. um, and you'll see um, visually impaired athletes um, look like uh, Frozone. So they have like glasses mm-hmm. on. And so they, so everyone is blinded equally. Okay. But he is the first athlete, visually impaired athlete, that has long jumped 22 feet. So think about that. That is jumping over two basketball goals on the ground or uh, over a giraffe. That's how far, and mm-hmm. blind. So his guide puts him at the end of the runway, mm-hmm. lines him up, and there is a takeoff board, mm-hmm. and then the sand. His guide goes down to the board, and he's clapping, go, 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 go. And as, as he gets closer, Lexi knows when to jump. Oh. He ju- And so he's running with no sight, straight down a runway, jumping off of one leg for a long jump into a pit. So his he has the world record at over 22 feet. I want our listeners to take a moment to think about that and really digest that. I mean, imagine yourself just closing your eyes completely and running. Right. And, and, and so relying on somebody else to, you know, that's... It, exactly. So that would be like me taking you at the end of a runway and saying, Dr. Yentes, close your eyes. And I want you to trust me that when you hear me clapping closer together, and you know when to take off and to fly in the air yeah. and jump in the sand, land safely in the sand, and exit that pit. It's wow. still um, um, amazing to me and that Lexi can jump over a giraffe or two basketball uh, goals, uh, hoops that are side by side pretty incredible yeah it's it's super incredible and it's it's a good reminder for all of us you know sometimes when we see individuals that have a a, a visible impairment we the I think the human tendency sometimes is to assume that maybe that limits their ability in other things but it really is a good reminder to not make those assumptions that that's correct so and, and some of the impairments we may not be able to see at yes, all. True. Um, and not even realize they're there even in an interview. Mm-hmm. But because of the classification system, then we have a level playing field yes. for all these athletes. It's always a good reminder, too, when you see somebody park in the parking spot. Yes. And they get out and they walk in and you're like, you don't have a placard. But you, you're, you don't look like you need a placard. It's right. a good reminder that not all impairments are visible. It is. And I mean, and for years, I mean, I've even, I had those assumptions before I started working with these athletes. So my introduction to these athletes was with Wounded Warriors Mm -hmm. um, and in San Antonio with track and field and with USA Cycling. 
um, with some of the cycling events they had in, in Pensacola, Florida. So I officiate for track and field and cycling also. So I, I officiate both the traditional athletes and on the para side also. So it's really nice for me to be able to have an eye and see what the comparison is between the ability levels of, of like athletes. And again, like with Hunter, I mean, he's running into a yeah. division one track and field and um, become an All-American and not yeah. given an accommodation at an NCAA championship where he is running with like individuals at the Paralympic Games. And how are these individuals qualifying for the Paralympics? Is it similar qualification process, similar it is. trials? Yep, it is. It's, it's, it is basically the same exact trials. So the trials that you see for the Olympic Games for Team USA, mm -hmm. we had the same exact qualifying for Team USA for the Paralympics. And some, say for example, if you need a guide, your guide has to be able to run fast enough to be able to keep up with you. So we have athletes that run in the Olympic Games and stay for the Paralympic Games that actually guide those individuals that say need, uh, say or they're visually impaired again, but they have to be able to run fast enough to be able to guide them to the finish line on a tether. On a tether, okay. So the question is then, if that uh, para-athlete wins uh, a medal, does the guide also receive a medal? Yes. Interesting. Yep. Very so interesting. It, it's the athlete that is highlighted, mm -hmm. but they work as a team. Okay. So they're treated as a team going forward. Co yes. And they probably have that partner it is probably a strong partnership and connection between the two of them. It, it is. It has to be. It is. It's a very strong partnership and they typically train together for years and years and years just to figure out how to be in sync with one another. They mm -hmm. train day in and day out with one another to do their strength and conditioning together. They may do their rehabilitation together. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, where they train, so they may train at the Olympic Training Center um, in Colorado Springs, or they may just train uh, with a team in their hometown. Okay. There's also a junior piece of that, so what I call um, – our, our rising stars. Mm -hmm. So these are our next Olympians that are in the pipeline. They come through a program called Move United. So if any of our listeners are looking for those individual or where to look for that information and say you're a junior athlete, so you're you know 11, 12, 13 years old, you can look for at Move United. So all of these sports are located in one place now um, for okay. you know rising athletes. Another interesting thing is Texas actually has taken the lead in offering, for example, UIL, track and field, offers para um, competition. Oh, okay. So they offer the seated shot put. They offer the 100-meter wheelchair and 400-meter wheelchair. So it, I think it's fantastic. It's a, you have to start somewhere, right? Yes. So they yes. have started there, and I think their programs are going to get larger and larger and larger um, as we go on with time. Yeah. And we will, for our listeners, we will be sure to put links to uh, Move United in the show notes as well as a few other links because my next question sort of relates to that. How do we increase the awareness? What can our listeners do to raise awareness for these athletes? One of the first things that you can do is if you see someone that, again, don't make an assumption, but if you see a visual impairment, so someone that may have what I call a brachial plexus injury, so they may have a weakness in an arm, mm -hmm. or they may be missing a limb, and they're competing with their able-bodied counterparts, tell someone. Mm -hmm. Because right now, that is kind of our pipeline for for athletes yeah. because many times these athletes don't even know that there is another path at all probably one of the well advantages and disadvantages of the Paralympic Games is they're only every four years right mm -hmm. we have world championships in para athletics which occur at those other two-year markers but the para athletes the para games are every four years with the Olympic Games. So it has very high visibility at that time, but it kind of wanes over time. Yeah. So if you see someone, 
say something. I mean, you can talk to, you, you can write me, for example, say, hey, I saw an athlete, how can they get involved? Or I have a child that has this impairment, what can I do? Hey, I'm uh, a college student, what can I do? I'm getting out of the military. Mm-hmm. I have um, a lower leg impairment or I had an amputation. How can I get involved? I can help you get involved. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for being on our podca- podcast today, uh, Dr. Colvin. We always ask our listeners if they have a take-home message. Is there any last words of wisdom you'd like to leave with our listeners? I would. I would like for our listeners to know that Texas A&M is now and will be the leader in para-athletics research and integration and performance. I believe from here until the 2028 Olympic Games come back to the United States, Woo-hoo! yay, and, and passed. So uh, Texas A&M as a university is committed. We have multi-disciplinary uh, teams that are working together with the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Committee. Uh, and with the national governing bodies. And if you want to be involved, please let me know. And we will be sure to include uh, Dr. Colvin's information in our show notes. And thank you so much, Dr. Colvin, for being here. You're welcome. And as we always say, if you have any comments or topics you would love to hear from us, we want to hear from you. So please email us at hoffines at tamu.edu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.